mercenary armies, destruction of the productive facilities of the society, more invasion, more sabotage, economic boycott, economic embargo, monetary embargo, technological embargo, which have distorting effects upon a society. In May of 1921, Lenin got up before the Bolshevik Party Convention and he said, we've had enough with the workers' opposition. Let's get rid of them. Now, the workers' opposition were loyal Bolsheviks. They were communists. They were in the Bolshevik Party. They were in the Communist Party. When the Kronstadt Rebellion came, the workers' opposition did not side with the Kronstadt sailors. They sided with the party. In the Civil War, they were with the party. Throughout all the struggles, the workers' opposition were with the party. But they had formed a self-conscious caucus that had decided that it would represent the particular interests of the industrial proletariat against the party itself at times. And after all this invasion, all this destruction, all this terrible death and, and, and struggle, where Lenin once said Soviet Russia is like a man with a death fever just hanging on by an inch of his life, after all that, Lenin turned and said, we've had enough opposition. The feeling very much was that that opposition was a wedge, an opening. It invited our enemies, our mortal enemies, to come in and attack us and divide us. And the party convention uproariously supported him and said, no more workers' opposition, no more factions within the party. So right there, that emphasis on a monolithic party. And by the way, that same month or the month before, in, in April, Lenin called for a strengthening of the trade unions and for more worker representation on the Central Committee of the Communist Party. And so it wasn't that he was moving anti-worker, it was that he was moving against opposition. So right there you see the seeds, you see, of a, of a system that could not develop naturally with an opposition, with checks, with internal debate and argument. A system that began to strain for uniformity, for siege, for lockstep uh, cooperation, the emphasis being on organizing, uh, <clears throat> getting the thing done, stop asking too many questions because everything was a life and death issue. When the Sandinistas came to power in Nicaragua 10 years ago, filled with ideals and hopes for their nation and their people, they discovered a very awful thing. And it wasn't about themselves, even though they had to do it to themselves. It was about that capitalist encirclement. They discovered that they needed a secret police. They discovered that they needed a security police. Because all around them, coming in from two borders and within their own society, were acts of sabotage, espionage, attack, mercenary invasion, and the like. And they understood that if the revolution was going to survive, it would have to build up instruments of state power, instruments of coercion even. And these instruments, by the way, can make mistakes. And these instruments can not only make mistakes, they can commit some serious crimes. Although in Nicaragua, the impressive record is how few crimes there were, given the utterly dire conditions they were under. So that kind of... that 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 capitalist encirclement which goes on unrelenting attacking any existing socialist communist if you don't want to call if, by the way if some of you don't want to call those societies socialist don't call them socialist call them window shades or camels whatever you want to call them as as long as you know what i mean that i mean i mean the i mean the public ownership of the means of production using capital in a different way not for capital accumulation per se as an end in itself a a, a strong social wage free education, free medical care, and uh, subsidized housing, subsidized food, subsidized bread, all those things that the Hungarians and Poles are now complaining about losing. That's what I mean by socialist. If you don't want to call that socialist, that's not what real social Real socialism is something that's going to exist someday when the world and people are better and different and it's going to come down and be in a much better form than those things were. That's fine. But in this world, see, I believe socialism is not that real beautiful goal in that society, participation, harmony, this and that. I believe that socialism is a process of struggle to achieve that thing. So, 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 so just go along with my vocabulary if you have tr even if you have trouble with it. Those socialist or communist societies suffered terrible distorting effects. If there had been no invasion, if there had been no espionage, if there had been no attack, if there had been no white guard armies burning villages, there wouldn't have been a Red Army of that size. There wouldn't have been a Stalin. There wouldn't have been a KGB. 
If there hadn't been a CIA, there wouldn't have been a KGB. If there hadn't have been, if there hadn't been a, 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 a NATO encirclement, there wouldn't have been a Warsaw Pact. And to lose sight of that fact is to lose sight of an essential force of what was going on over those 70 years. Or 10 years. And if you want to know what the Soviet Union went through in its early years, just look at what Nicaragua went through in these 10 years. And then multiply that by 10. Every single one of those countries was targeted. They were targeted by missiles. They were targeted by acts of espionage. They were targeted by, as I say, uh, economic embargo and all sorts of other forms of aggression. They were targeted by in in incredible propaganda barrages and the like. Unrelenting, unremitting. The most targeted socialist country in the world as of a couple of years ago and actually still to today is not Nicaragua, was not Nicaragua, not even Cuba. It was the Soviet Union. All those missiles were pointing to the USSR. They still are. And they're still building those missiles. And they're refusing to negotiate those missiles, it, it, the sea-based missiles, which is where the U.S. has 75% of its first strike force. They have announced that they will not negotiate that 75% of the first strike force. Only their 25%, which is land-based. And the Soviets, of course... 75% of their force is land-based and only 25% is sea-based and, and not of it, none of it working very well because they've got just a few choke points and they don't have that much access to sea. And they don't have all the fueling stations and harbors and whatever else that the U.S. has around the world. So that kind of encirclement is still there and that kind of thing is still going on. And so if you want to understand something about it, and that's why Gorbachev is one of the reasons he's trying to normalize international relations, even at the risk of giving away the whole store, 